This week's episode is brought to you by ArteryInc.com. Artery Inc. is a local Milwaukee, Wisconsin company that specializes in anatomy-themed apparel and artwork. Whether you work in healthcare or whether you don't, you can definitely find something there that you would love to have. We encourage you to go to www.arteryinc.com. Use our promo code PHPOD to save 10% on orders of $35 or more. And please note, it does not apply to their subscription box service. podcast this week we are doing a medicine museum episode and we're fortunate enough to spend time talking with dr monica walker phd from the old operating theater in london england now i'm going to admit that this week's episode's a little bit longer than our normal but i think it's worth it in this episode monica who is literally talking to us from the operating theater or just down the hall from it paints a pretty incredible picture of what surgery was like in the Victorian era. And we're going to talk about a bunch of those things, the history of the hospital. We're going to talk about some of the surgeries that were done. We're going to literally walk through kind of what one particular surgery had to entail. And it's not necessarily very graphic, but it there are certainly some things that in Victorian era surgery are hard to wrap your mind around in an age before anesthetic. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about anesthetics. We're going to talk about a lot of that stuff. And we had a lot of fun doing it. So without further ado, let's jump over to the interview. We're here with Dr. Monica Walker from the Old Op Theater in London, England. How are you today? I'm doing fine. Thank you so much for the invite. Any time. We were just talking, we were all commiserating about the wonderful weather that everybody is having all over the temperate world now. Well, it is getting to be like winter, right? <laughs> well, one thing I'm a little worried about, Monica, I see you're, you're up in the rafters there. Uh, is there any insulation in the building uh, in which you are sitting right now? Uh, no. <laughs> just no. a flat no no there is no no now, i know <laughs> i know this is an audio medium and you know, nobody can see what uh, we're looking at here but can you describe where where are you sitting right now what is what is this uh this room uh, so i'm basically sitting in what used to be the herb garrett of Paul St. thomas's hospital um it's actually in the attic of uh the church of st thomas's it looks atticky <laughs> used to be part of you know the hospital but uh one of the really fascinating things is that uh, the space was basically designed on purpose. Um, it was meant to be a storage space uh, for the surplus of the hospital. And soon after, the apothecary of St. Thomas's took over the space and requested it for the for their use, so they could dry and cure herbs, so that they could just you know leave things here to macerate and you know create tinctures and all of the different medicines oh. that they were making at the time. Um, and of course, the the attic was fabulous because. It was dark. There were no windows. Um, the wood kept the temperature not constant, but at least uh, um, out of light, away from vermin. Um, so it was quite ideal for the apothecaries to kind of use it. And they used it for about 100 years. That's kind of like for how long the space was used um, by them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so we're standing there. Unfortunately, the attic does not have any insulation of any kind. We basically... <laughs> Freeze in the winter and burn in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have like a barrel fire near you? Yeah, is your office in the attic then? Um, uh, it's actually in the tower. Uh, the tower is quite the large. The Tower of London? Um, oh. the, no, the Tower of St. Thomas's Church is a belfry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the belfry itself is quite large. And um, so at one point when we, when we were able to install a, um, a lift for access and goods, uh, we were able to divide the space and and kind of like carved a little bit of an office for us, uh, which oh. is not very big. Um, Are there bats in the is, belfry? Um, no, not anymore. <laughs> there used to be just kind of like, like flying rats, a.k.a. pigeons. <laughs> Ooh. Ah, I like it. But they're all gone now. <laughs> 
like it looks like the the perfect space to sit and think about medical history and exist in medical history and yeah. and and just generally muse. It's a good musing space. I think the listener will just have to take our word for it. Ah, uh, I, I I think it really is because when you are here, when you are in this space, and and I say this as someone that knew nothing of the space before I came here for the first time. I didn't even know that it existed. Um, hmm. I mean, you can't see it from outside. You see the church. But, you know, there's nothing to indicate that there's something in the attic, which makes it kind of like exciting. There is this element of discovery that you have to come a 50, 52 step spiral staircase. It's kind of narrow. People either hate it or love it. <laughs> you know, there is like no in between, <laughs> apparently. Um, people just like, oh, we love the spiral staircase. And then the other people are like, oh, my God, don't go there. The spiral staircase is horrible. <laughs> it's <kind laughs> it's like, dangerous. Oh, yeah. What about the space? You know, it's like, <laughs> this is how we get here. Um, but yeah, I mean, the moment that you come in here, what you feel is the weight of history. Um, it is an original space. It's a space where things actually happened. You know, it's a little bit of a time capsule in a way, um, because every time that we talk about our space is that the space itself is our main exhibition. Without the space, without... Uh, the church being here without having access to this attic, there will be no museum. Um, because our collection is a medical new collection from the 18th, 19th century. And there are so many other museums, um, especially here in England um, and Scotland, that actually have um, the same similar kind of collection. I mean, there's the Welcome Collection, there's the Hunterian, the Surgeon's mm -hmm. Hall, there is like the Leeds Infirmary and like that, so many other things. What they don't have is actually a space that used to be used by apothecaries as a herb garret. Um, by mm -hmm. the way, garret is a really old word for attic. It's very British, very old. Ah, and everybody okay. always Garrett? asks us, oh, yeah, garret. G-A-R-R-E-T. So everybody always says, is that a person? Like herb garret? <laughs> and I, was, I, just like, garret. <laughs> I knew that like, guy in high school. <laughs> I know, right? You know, that herb, you know? Yeah. A lot of so, herbs um, in my yeah. generation. Yeah, He's no, got two first names, it. though, so you can't trust him. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but yeah, the the herb garret itself. But yeah, the um, the garret is a very like good like name for, for attic. But yeah, it was... Um, it's, it's this idea that that this is an actual space that later on, you know, kind of like went on to become uh, an operating theater for the women's wards of Falls and Thomas's Hospital. Um, and it's actually the space where that happened. And I think that there is something about being in these these historic spaces that can really help transport you back in time to have the ability to visualize how things were in the past um, to Set yourself in the position of the students, of the surgeons, of the dressers, even of the patient, and really, really, really kind of like feel, well, you know, I, I'm so happy to be alive in the 21st century, you know, because I don't have to <laughs> yeah. go through what they went. <laughs> oh, I, mean, I just saw a meme. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> it was. I just realized I just ruined a flow. <laughs> um, there was a there was a guy eating macaroni and cheese, and he puts a pinch of pepper on his macaroni and cheese. He's like, you know, you currently are living, you know, better than uh, a medieval king. <laughs> I mean, it's it's true in pretty much uh, almost. I mean, in so many other ways, it's it's. I never. I, I think our rec one of the recurring themes is, is that we just. It's really cool to study medical history and really cool to appreciate not living in medical history. Well, I, I oh, guess we God. are, but you know, not yeah, living true. in the history that we're reading about. And I, I like surgery with anesthesia and nerve yeah. blocks and yeah. uh, <laughs> you know uh, those sorts of things yeah. and you know early diagnosis of cancers and you know all that sort of thing. It's all super important. Yeah. And yes, the, the old days may be nostalgic but not necessarily better just by being in the past oh no i mean one of the other, the things people ask me oh will you travel to the past and i'm like no i will die in two <laughs> yeah. days you know or i will burn at the stake i don't know either one two one you know right? <laughs> yeah it's not gonna be watch that yeah was it outlander so, very similar yeah. idea yeah yeah it never ends well but, it yeah, never no. ends well there is no time travel you know ever i mean <laughs> Not, well, time no. travel itself is the conflict, so it has to be the conflict. And so there's, you know, it's not. Nobody did time travel. It was like, but you know, this all worked out well. You're not, gonna, you're not going to go see that movie. <laughs> so the, that movie. the layout of the space, where so 
compared to where you're sitting, where's the operating theater itself that's also in the video, which looks really cool? Is that so? It's in the same space. Uh, so the okay. attic was 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 quite large, and originally was a unified space. So okay. um, and it was not really connected to the church underneath us. Um, there was always a, a secondary entrance that the people that worked in the hospital could have access to, and so that was kind of like what what they used to do. Um, what they did in eighteen twenty two was basically put a divider. So they just created um, a, a newer construction uh, on half of the operating theater, of, on half of the herb garret, sorry, because it's quite a large, I don't know if I can just show you a little bit, like how well, big well, it panning. is, you know? That looks know. like a perfect, perfectly fine operating room. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, nice and clean, well lit. That's Pigeons can wow. come in the window. Just, just like a still. modern space. To, yeah, it's <laughs> it's very still, sterile. <laughs> Yeah, very well. Yeah, super sterile. So yeah, the the, the operating uh, theater when it was constructed, they just partitioned the space. Um, uh, one third became the operating theater itself. So what they did was to create like um, railings and stands. Um, there's mm. like five of them with railings. Uh, it's meant to be an, a standing operating theater. Uh, they raised them uh, enough so that everybody had an uninterrupted view into the center where they place an operating table, obviously all made out of wood. And then what they did was to connect um, the space that used to be quite separate with a couple of entrances with the actual women's wards, because this was part of this huge reconstruction that happened in the hospital um, uh, in the late 17th, early 18th century. So we know that the space was um, had been used as all St. Thomas's Hospital all the way back to the um, 12th century. So there has been oh, a wow. hospital here in this site since the 12th century. Um, but of course, with all of the changes in history and all of the three things that happened, you know, first being part of a monastic community, then after the Reformation, more kind of uh, secularized, but still religion played a very important part of um, of healthcare and well-being. I mean, mm-hmm. even today, many of our hospitals still have a multi-faith um, kind of chapel in it, which is, of course, still just as important. Um, or not anymore, you know, who knows, mm-hmm. but it is part of the, of the, the actual the space, option. you know, the option mm-hmm. is there, right? But the church was constructed at the same time than the rest of the hospital. You have to imagine that the space, the hospital was quite, quite large at the time. I, I mean, I'm trying to think about, it was, was it like the size of like two football stadiums? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Which kind of football? Oh, that is huge. <laughs> American you or football. F-O. Um, yeah, American thanks football. Thanks for pandering to us. We, yeah. we, that's, yeah. we really <laughs> think of those terms. I appreciate yeah. it. How many, how many yards understand. long is that? <laughs> how many I have meters? No idea. I, don't, I, 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 I do meters. I don't do anything. <laughs> um, I mean, the idea is like, I don't know if you're familiar with the typography of, uh, of London Bridge, but it went all the way from Borough High Street until the Shard, which is the tallest building here in, uh, in London Bridge. It went from St. Mm-hmm. Thomas's Street to two street on the other direction, closer to the to the riverside. So um, okay. the hospital was like very long, connected east west, and then a little bit shorter from the north and the south. And it had like three interconnected courtyards that were quite large, uh, with two additional ones at the end that were a little bit smaller. Each courtyard had buildings around uh, around them that rose up to three floors high. They wanted mm. to you know, ensure that they had enough light. So every single one of the wards were basically halls with lots of windows on both sides. That's why you wanted the courtyards. And of course, each one of those courtyards and the buildings around it con- were connected with different functions of the hospital. So courtyard that was co- closer to Borough High Street that was connected with all the women's wards. So mm. strict separation of the sexes. All of the women were placed on one side of the hospital. Then the third courtyard in the other direction, closer to the shore, were for the men's ward. So that's where you put all the men. You put it there. Wait, and are you the saying central... they got a better view? I, I <laughs> don't know. Fair. I w- I, you know what? I wouldn't say so because they okay. basically led to the second and third courtyard. And that's where the foul wards were. So basically, that's where you put all your syphilitic patients. Oh, <laughs> okay. Do you see so, foul wards? Yeah, they're called foul wards. <laughs> <laughs> I was imagining a bunch of chickens. You have, oh, there, there, a lot of hospitals in England had them. That's basically the, the, the wards that were meant to keep the patients that needed the most kind of extremes kind of treatments that involved like fouling themselves, like literally, you know, defecating <laughs> or, you know, vomiting or, you know, doing fun things like salivation. If you had syphilis where you are basically rubbed with a mercury oil 
wrap around, mm -hmm. you know, a blanket, put in front of the fire so you sweat everything out. That's how you sweat syphilis <laughs> out. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert, <laughs> it doesn't work. Please do not try this at home. Yeah. <laughs> just, Im yeah, just imagine being a nurse at that hospital and then you get your assignment for the day and like, oh, you're on the fall ward. You're on the fall ward. <laughs> like, oh. Yeah. I, you know, I bet I know where new nurses to the profession went first. Yeah, yeah sure. New nurses the started ward. in the foul ward. Yep. Uh, well, nice. actually, sure. nursing, the nursing actually started in this hospital back okay. in eighteen sixty. Oh, you mean as the as the profession? As a profession, you're yeah. Ah, okay. Before Be that, before or had... after the foul word? Oh no, 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 they were still there even after. Okay, <laughs> not there now, right? Uh, yeah, no, not, not anymore. All right, just check. I think that they they stopped doing these kind of like treatments where you end up having to, yeah, empty <laughs> stigmatize everything. and not treat your patients. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, I, I think that my fun part was the fact that in St. Thomas's they still had one of those. Oh, how do you call them? You know, the things that that people gave lashes. You know. Oh, the stocks and bar uh, barracks. Stacks. Uh, what is it? There the stockade? Have, the or, yeah, stockade. Mm -hmm. yeah, the stockade. St. Thomas has actually had stockade in one of the courtyards. Um, and oh. every syphilitic patient, every time that they were discharged, received one or two lashes, you know, because they'd be naughty. <laughs> On the way out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, are the stocks still I'm sorry. there? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, there's very little of the hospital that you can still still see, because despite the fair, massive fair. Uh, amount of the hospital, how big it was in that time period, only the south end of the first courtyard and the second courtyard have um, have survived. Ah, uh, gotcha, gotcha. Has it Everything... been repurposed or? Yeah, some of them has been repurposed. Uh, the women's wards actually became part of uh, the post office. Uh, the Royal Postal Office and British Transport Police offices. It okay. sounds so much better when it's the Royal Post Office. Mm -hmm. it's not just, I know, not just not just any post office. <laughs> it's the Royal one. In England, it's the Royal <laughs> Post Office. My yes. <laughs> I figured it was going to be like a Royal Starbucks or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's usually called Royal Mail. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, it's just, it's I, I wonder if the same principle applies. So the, the one of the jokes, at least over here in the U.S., is that anytime the government moves into a building and usually like starts a post office, it could take this amazing, beautiful building on the outside and you go inside and you're like, oh, my God, this is a government building. It's just like <laughs> gray slate, blue tones, thousand yard stairs. Yeah. And it just it, it's does the Royal Post Office do the same thing or do you walk in and there's like thrones and gold and it's just you know, no, pomp and it's, circumstance? It's. You can tell that it's been taken over by no. the government. <laughs> it's it's just very bland. Uh, so disappointing. For purpose. Even I mean, even the women's wards. I mean, and and you know, it was really interesting because obviously the women's wards still exist. It's just that it was just this huge hall that went from one side of the of like up to like the church all the way to to the to the actual like was it like five hundred meters more than that um, that actually had these amazing you know kind of like humongous windows and all that um, and they basically have partitioned that and made it into smaller offices with like fake walls and things like that so yeah. <laughs> of course it, they even, it makes sense to reuse. If we wanted to 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 kind of like like claim that part just to really tell the story better of what Alton Thomas's used to be like, I mean it's impossible. I mean now we have just introduced yeah. um, um, a pair of, of doors um, at the end of the of, of the operating uh, theater because we always used to have this question when people came up the spiral staircase and the the question that everybody had: How did they get the patients up the stairs? <laughs> That's quite, yeah, we were gonna Aaron ask, and I were just yeah, I talking like, about that they, right before you got on. It's a limited <laughs> number of surgeries you could do, right? If you have to be able to walk up the stairs. Exactly. But that, the, the thing is that the, the spiral staircase was never the entrance into the space. Um, there was always a secondary entrance. And of course, when once it became an operating theater, what they did was, uh, I mean, they, they share a wall. You know, you have to imagine that this building was made at the same time. The church was made at the same time as the hospital because it was part of the same complex. Um, and of course, the fact that it, this was already being used for storage, it just pretty much meant that you know the, the hospital had all the rights to basically repurpose it to whatever they saw fit. And of course, <laughs> before 1822, the women's kind of original operating theater was at the end of the ward with one bed um, place and a bunch of stay out of chairs, you know, kind of around the bed. Um, mm -hmm. And it, the operations will happen more or less in front of the rest of the patients on the ward. No, sure. That's, I mean, why not? That sounds great. <laughs> I know. I I'm mean, sure. 
Sure, inspired confidence. And, and what year was that, uh, roughly? Or what, what time period are we talking about? I mean, this is 1822. Okay, so pre-anesthesia. Oh, no. <laughs> pre-anesthesia, yeah. 1822, definitely before anesthesia, yeah. The man oh. already had an operating theater in St. Thomas's in 1755. Mm. On the men's wards. Sure, that was rough, too. Right. Well, in, in, let's talk about, so there's there's tons of history there, right? And you oh, had yes. mentioned, I think to me, there's there's so many famous names in medicine that literally practice there. Is there yeah. not? Is there a few you would like to chat about? Uh, you, know, you had highlighted one or two to me, but uh, I'm happy to go wherever <laughs> the fancy takes. I mean, um, it's it's really, Olsen uh, Thomas' hospital is just so fascinating. And there's been so many people that have come through here um, I mean, there's this, this anecdote of this, of this um, one of the surgeons of St. Thomas's in the 16th century. Unfortunately, I forgot to double check his name before I got here, but it's somewhere. But um, um, apparently he basically cut the stone or tried to cut the stone, which basically was a word for uh, performing a lithotomy, okay. basically a removal of bladder stone. In the 16th yeah, and for, century. For, I'll just give a little background on what, like, lithotomy. Yeah, so lithos, like, meaning stone, and then otomy, meaning remove. This was one of the few, the, when you had kidney stones, or when kidney stones go from the kidneys down to the bladder, and sit in the bladder, and then possibly plug up the bladder, it's a giant deal back before you have fiber optic cameras that you can put somebody completely to sleep and go inside mm -hmm. without making incisions and break up stones and take them out to have kidney stones blocking your kidneys so they're not working and then possibly getting infected or having stones in your bladder that will not let your bladder drain and therefore will cause kidney failure and just imagine if you could not go to the bathroom and how awful that would be mm -hmm. to have to do urological surgery back in the day was brutal because they had to well i you may be talking about it but when they say lithotomy <laughs> this is removing of stones and when you don't have the f modern tools there's this is kind of a this is kind of a brutal procedure to say the least well yeah especially in the 16th century <laughs> but um the, the the thing with with uh with that is that it is one of the operations that they, they knew how to do really well and and yeah, I mean the removal of bladder stones was was quite an important. And St. Thomas's has a very long-standing history of being in the forefront of developing new techniques and and kind of like new procedures that will aid and help you know to remove them, if not safely, at least faster, which means safely in this time period <laughs> of pre-anesthesia, pre-antiseptics, right? Sure. Uh, there, there used to be these, um, and in the past they were known as stone cutters, you know, not to be you know confused mm. with the actual like <laughs> masons, you know. That cut stone, sure, sure. Uh, but more like the <laughs> surgeons that cut the stone, stone cutters. Actually, Cromwell himself requested uh, that these uh, surgeons from St. Thomas's came to his aid because he had a really bad case of of lithotomy and oh, sorry of uh, of um of the bladder of a bladder stone. At least sure. he believes so. And and this 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 surgeon from St. Thomas's went to see him, this stone cutter, and he was a rogalist. <laughs> so. Um, mm. So this is a, time, you'll have to give our listeners a little background, I think. But this is basically he. Are you saying he's like the opposite political party? Yes. So basically, right they're like, you know, just imagine, you know, Democrats and Republicans. by our listeners, imagine, I mean me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be honest, that part I'm, I'm a bit shaky. I just know that that Cromwell was um like a political leader uh, during the time of. Uh, political turmoil in the 16th century and it basically just meant that he was against the royals and you know sure. different claims to the throne i mean seriously this is kind of like basically, game of the thrones. other the, the doctor from the other thrones. side had to come, come basically he had to call on the doctor from the opposing yes. political party and yes. given the u.s we're pretty cohesive politically so i don't think this we all get along over here to, to yeah. the u.s population but you know that being yeah. said we'll try to we'll try to imagine uh, what it's so just like imagine to have, that to um, <laughs> and then of course and of course uh, this, this surgeon got there. He was very cavalier, apparently. He was, you know, fighting with the royals and whatnot. And, but he <laughs> went because he was requested. So he went, tried to, to help Cromwell. And then as uh, Cromwell started feeling better, the surgeon just turned around and he said, a toast to the king and queen <laughs> in front of him. <laughs> and then we were like, are we going to kill this guy <laughs> or what? <laughs> and Cromwell was like, no, he just helped me. Let him leave, let him leave, go away. <laughs> but this is the last time <laughs> that you defy me. <laughs> uh, sur surgeons and, and egos going back uh, many surgeons. centuries. Oh, I, uh, I respect absolutely. the power move, though. 
I mean, me too. I thought that that was like very boldsy of him, you know, but um, you also have something like the first exhibition of, that we had, like literally, an, I, I don't even want to call it like an art exhibition, but kind of like the first exhibition that St. Thomas has had in the 16th century was when they purchased uh, a really long piece of wool from where they hung all of the stones that they had cut from people. And then they hung it at the entrance of the hospital. <laughs> That's just... <laughs> Why? Why it's like a, a hospital soaked. today having like a wall of appendixes. Yeah, mm. it's blood, like, hey, look how good we froth. are. Look how many stones we got. Yeah. We're so good. Look at all our stones. We got more yeah. stones than. <laughs> yeah. Just imagine, like, you could do so much with that because you could have like countertops, you could use epoxy pores, and you could take like a bunch of anatomical specimens. Like, hey, we've removed all these, uh, you know, all these appendixes. And you just put them in the epoxy, and that's like the countertop. You walk in to check into the hospital, and you're like, wow, look at the, what is this? Oh, these are appendixes. I love this. Look at appendices. the appendices. Really- yeah. yeah, I mean that was the a- that was the best yeah old timey class in my med school. We go down this hall into the basement of the Veterans Administration Hospital, which is a government building. So it was like creepy and poorly lit, <laughs> and an old pathologist would just bring out these white plastic tubs and put them on the table and pull stuff out and be like, "Look at this!" And we're like, "Oh my god!" Do you want to play with bladder, it? <laughs> you know, like mega colon. You're like, "What is that? What is that? That came out of a human." Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Uh, I mean, that was just kind of like anecdotal because that happened so long ago. And like I said, I always kind of like forget the name of that particular cavalier kind of gentleman surgeon. But if we we go back into like St. Thomas's closer to the time when our our space was active, you know, we have someone like um, William Cheselden. Um, and Chelsea is a fairly highly recognized name, part of the St. Thomas's um, kind of like was here for a while. He was one of our demonstrators. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that he did was basically introduce a lateral, in- lateral incision for lithotomy, which mm-hmm. basically meant that um, access to the stone was quicker. He basically claimed that in about 218 uh, removals of um, stone, he only lost 20 patients. Which for the time would have been pretty Which, amazing. Exactly. I mean, it was also done quite quickly in under one minute, uh, two minutes, sorry, under two minutes. Jeez. And yeah, that was, uh, uh, Victorian surgery is known as speed surgery for a reason. You really yeah. want this to be like as fast as possible. Yep, good and surgeon Chesel is a was, surgeon. Yeah. You know, that's what you've got to do. And he was one of the best in, 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 that, in that department for like bringing in this, you know, increasing survival rate um, in something that was very common, much more in men than in women. But that is one of the things that, that, that was really going on in that time period. And Chesolden was at the forefront of it. Um, and he was also one of our, like, one of our ours. We call it ours. St. Thomas's man. Of course, they went on and they ended up working for all the hospitals. <laughs> But for the time that he was here, he was one of ours. But that, like, that's just kind of like lately thought to me. I mean, surgery in that time period, especially in, in the operating theater, uh, was not just uh, confined to lithotomies. You also had trepanations. Obviously, that's drilling holes in the head. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep, we did. We did do an episode on trepanation. Oh, oh, oh gosh, it's been a while now. But uh, yep, putting while. putting a hole in the head. You can you can go sophisticated style with like surgical drills, or you can use rocks. It just it really depends <laughs> on uh, depends on your facilities, depends on your training, or what century it is. Yeah, and yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, the tools that we have here for for um for 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 trepanation is it's quite uh yeah no they, they just look like corkscrews you know of some sort it's just quite terrifying yeah um just it's to think corkscrew. about it yeah but just like in, in many ways it's really fascinating because we have actually a one of four pathology samples is a skull of a patient that survived trepanning um a trepanation mm-hmm. so you mm-hmm. can literally see the growth above the the hole where it was drilled but they, again let us know that you know we may consider these kind of like um, procedures quite barbaric at the time because they were being done with non anesthesia or antiseptics, but at the same time, the realization that they actually did save people's lives, you know, mm-hmm. and the people mm-hmm. went on to have like whatever you want to call that type of life at the time. I mean, it wouldn't be that nice, but um, it did kind of work. I mean, we have also the third procedure is amputations. And mm-hmm. that pretty much meant not just or, of amputations that dealt with like members, um, but also extirpation of tumors, anything that mm-hmm. is outside of or chest cavity, basically anything in the trunk before our neck and the hips, 
inside, no, you can't touch it at that time period. Anything that is on top of that in many ways was fair game. You could potentially do something about it that will result in, you know, some sort of um, survival for the patient. That's what they dared to do these operations because they had been proven to be quite effective. Things like, I don't know, you have a compound fracture and mm -hmm. bone has splinter, it has broken through the skin, you can see the bone, you can see the flesh being torn. You know, first attempt will be to put it back together, right? Mm -hmm. Somehow. But then at that point in the time period where, you know, they don't understand the infection, they don't understand germs. Sure. They're just completely trying to figure out things, how they're happening. They see things that are superating. There's the poo, suddenly there's the smell, and then, you know, the blackened area. And they all know that that means that your patient is going to die. And don't, so need you have a, to... don't need any kind of medical degree when you, <laughs> when you see that kind of constellation of findings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that, that that's quite right. Uh, so basically, you, you know what has to be done. You know, at that point, you have to amputate that member, be that a finger, a, 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 a an arm, a leg, I don't know, whatever it is, it has to be removed if you want your patient to mm -hmm. survive. And fascinating enough, we did have really amazing surgeons in St. Thomas's that were incredible in the way that they approached this. Uh, one of them was uh, Sir Ashley Cooper, mm -hmm. quite famous. He became a royal kind of like surgeon um, during his lifetime. We, he had quite, quite a long uh, lifespan, but um, he's one of my um, historical crushes. I have to admit this. <laughs> Apparently, you know, he's, I wish I, I, I really want to meet this man, honestly. If uh, this is one of those things, if I have the chance to, oh, with whom will you have dinner one day? You know, I, this is one of, of my historical characters that I wish I had dinner with, um, just because I find him to be fascinating. Apparently, charismatic, charming, love pranks, mm. you know, um, very determined to basically make a name for himself. Did you say loves um, pranks? Yeah, he he was he was a prankster. He did quite horrifying things to his servants and his students, even oh, no. during his time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, you. I don't know. Did you do, guys do you have, have examples? I, I have one, which is quite horrifying. But um, did you guys have anything like that in med school? You know, like you got like somebody making a joke, a prank on you, or something like that. <laughs> we. I mean, we were all extremely serious. We took uh, every moment of medical school very seriously. Uh, I don't remember. I think I just remember books. I um, stayed stayed in my uh, apartment. I know my wife was there at the same time. I know. What was your guys' experience like? No, there were pranks. I mean, one of them that I can kind of recall was that um, cadaver meat looks a lot like Qdoba chicken. <laughs> <laughs> somebody ate a piece of Qdoba chicken in the the lab. I was like, oh, this tastes like formaldehyde. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, it's um, it, oh, God, I'm I'm actually I'm going through a, a mental Rolodex, and I'm trying to find a story that I could share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There, I have great plan. stories, but yeah, no, I'm not trying to worry worry any listener. It's just I, I also, yeah, I'll just leave that to the imagination for now. But I get no, yeah, there are some other pranks. How about the like in the room, and you know, you got a, a patient that you're getting along with, and they're on the heart monitor. You just shake their chest, and it looks like they're in VTAC, and you just wait to see <laughs> when somebody's gonna run in. <laughs> 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 That's, I mean, that, so one, one of the hospitals I used to work for way before medical school, I was what was called a scribe. So I typed charts, follow doctors around kind of thing, but I was a fly on the wall. So you got to see all this stuff. And one, uh, I, there was one doctor <laughs> that I worked with who had a really good sense of humor and had a pension for goofing around with the paramedic students that would float through the emergency department. And uh, so one pair of particularly good natured uh, paramedic students who are very enthusiastic were present and uh, something came in. I, I don't remember the specifics, but it was like a code or some sort of like, um, you know, like a really sick patient or whatnot. And some of those situations look crazier than they are when you're really working behind the scenes, you know? So like if I don't believe it was like CPR, it might've been like a trauma or something, but I remember the patient was awake and the doctor turned to the paramedic students who were like really eager to help. And he's like, guys, I need you to go to the fifth floor right now and get some fallopian tubes. Please go up to the fifth floor, get some fallopian tubes. We really need them right now. <laughs> and you know, you got a, you got an attending doctor just like telling you what to do. And you know, so they were like, okay, well, we'll go. I mean, they're really enthusiastic. So they go running up to the fifth floor. Um, which happened to be labor and delivery at this hospital. 
And so <laughs> that's so mean. They go running up to the labor and delivery like nurse desk, and they're like, "We need fallopian tubes down in the emergency <laughs> department right now." And and apparently, it wasn't the first time that this guy he had done this. And so the nurses up there were like, "Snap!" Right on it. They're like, "No, no, no. Those we used to have them up here, but they're down on the third floor. You got to go." And so they got they apparently got it to about two other places before somebody was like, I think somebody's having fun with you guys. And they, <laughs> That's really good. They did not find the fallopian tubes. He also, he also sent uh, a, like a different pair of uh, very, very eager to help uh, paramedic students uh, off to go find a bucket of steam from the boiler room. <laughs> so, <laughs> they tried. Yeah. They tried. Yeah, no. SB Cooper was a character in that way. I mean, um, he, he, he trained here in St. Thomas's and then became main demonstrator. But even during the time that he was like, he was, he was kind of like an empiricist. Uh, he did not believe in just taking the, the word of, the, of tradition uh, at mm. face value. He wanted to experiment and continue to kind of like see what he could learn. He basically thought that his day was, did not start until after he had dissected something, you know, be that an animal or a human. It didn't matter at that point, you know, comparative anatomy, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, and at one point, he basically um, started doing all these dissections at home. And so he invited a, one of his students at one point at home, and they were doing some, <laughs> some dissection of uh, an animal. He had this deal with the Tower of London that used to have a menagerie that if any animal died, they will send the animal to Cooper's home so he could just dissect it. And here sure. comes a monkey. They, he had a monkey. He got the monkey. And basically what he did was like hide the monkey brains in this kind of like in a snuff box (laughs) (laughs) sounds like his whole house was a snuff box (laughs) (laughs) and literally got his uh i mean his servant just like oh let's let's laugh a little bit you know and servant comes you know at that time you know with the snuff box and and of course you know hilarity ensue when the poor man was asked to open it and then then there it is you know all the monkey <laughs> brains instead of the snuff box trying to put it on his nose yeah mm-hmm. um that was just like one example might not be as funny as if wait did you did you say he tried <laughs> to put the monkey brains in his nose yeah <laughs> well oh. that was the whole snuff thing you know like oh okay yeah because you <laughs> snuff you take a little tobacco and you snort it yeah. and yeah yeah i get yeah, it yeah exactly i mean i feel like when i open the box and i see it even if I'm not an anatomist, I'm like, that's a brain or that's jelly-like. Uh, that's not Yeah, snuff. I mean, he, it's not that he tried. He was just kind of horrified when he did the, the whole like mm-hmm. motion towards it as he opened it. And he realized, mm-hmm. oh, that's not what I thought it was. And then everybody was laughing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he was like, he had like this, this character that just because he was supposed to be good looking and charismatic and super charming, everybody just mm-hmm. forgave him everything, you know? That's how I get through life. <laughs> <laughs> but he was he was such such a good surgeon he was he always um did everything with a lot of precision he wrote a lot about things like strangulated hernias mm-hmm. he wrote this this book about the strangulated hernias and how to deal with them at the time and became you know recognizable like worldwide a whole treaty on how to deal with like bone setting and and of course uh, how to deal with fractures including how amputate things you know there was like very very interesting way of uh, actually going through the whole motions but yeah i mean charismatic you know learned always had a couple of body snatchers up his pocket so he always had the fresh the most fresh you know you gotta like corpses yeah so he can dissect you them those. You, ha- you gotta have those i mean i think that my favorite kind of like story from him has to do when um on his honeymoon he went to france during the age of terror and as sure. part of, I mean, yeah, that, that's that's what you do, right? You, you know, sure. as you do, you just, as you do, yep. as you do, you go. It's it's your vacation. Find time, a place with a conflict good. and go visit. Yeah, sure. You know, he just went to every single you know medical demonstration and the section in Paris, and then things got a little bit like heated up at one point, and he's like, "Well, I better take my wife back to the, <laughs> to to the island just in case things get even more heated." And of course, as he is crossing the channel. Uh, the one thing that he brings with him are a bunch of souvenirs amongst them. Lots and mm-hmm. lots and lots of body parts Aww. to dissect at home. What was the How age of terror? The there were a lot of body parts. Just, yeah. <laughs> just, I'll right. just take this. I'll take this basket here. I'm going to take this basket. Just picture a I steamer mean... trunk leaking blood. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have plastic bags. I mean, how do you, how do you get that? I guess. In a trunk. 
Yeah, I'm okay. not kidding. I, I kind of like, yeah. I kind of want to have a, a word with his wife as well because he's mm -hmm. like, <laughs> what sure. honey, those are she knew what she was getting into. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, I don't know how those got in there. We had no, a I Halloween mean, bin in the anatomy lab that they mm -hmm. just uncovered on Halloween night, and it was all like cross sections of heads and stuff. It's all this Ooh. anti anatomy, but they're like, "Here's today's lesson." And we're like, yeah, "Oh, but you my didn't God. take it back to your, you didn't take it back." To no, your I didn't carry him study. around. No, no, I, mean, I didn't. you probably no. did, but most normal people wouldn't. <laughs> no, no, I was boring in med school. I had all my kids in med school. All I did was go to class and come home and hold children. So, but yeah, <laughs> I. I very boring. That's too wholesome for this show. I know. I'm sorry. I know. I didn't want to. Bring, I didn't want to. I didn't want to bring the vibe down. It's like no. Mm -mm, just no. went home, slept. I know. Just, it's, it's, so it happens. So how many? How many trunks of body parts did he have? I mean, just like <laughs> one is a trip. On this. Listen, it has had a, a couple of them. Anyway, it's just like um, it's just kind of like a demonstration of how important you know uh, learning by experimentation and observation was to him, you know, because in that time period, the idea was that you will not, if you're a student, you will never actually, you know, touch a, a, a live person until a long time later, you know, you sure. have to go, to, you have to go to the operating theater to learn about these procedures through observation. And then you have to learn about anatomy by dissecting bodies. And then you have to perform the operations on a dead body and then anatomize the dead body afterwards to see what the damage of what you did, was it right? Was it wrong? You know, then yeah. you had to become an assistant after you finish your, um, your examinations to the main surgeon, which meant that you were getting closer and closer and closer to the live patient in the operating table. And then finally, after you have had a lot of experience and you have had a lot of like time assisting your, your surgeon to do like the basic things like prep the operating uh, theater and um, ensure that after the amputation has been performed, you do your ligatures, you put everything back, you clear everything, you Always dress important. the wound always important after you do all that then you get to do your your first uh, surgical procedure but not before you have had these you know amount of experience beforehand sure. to understand the human body and even though you know how they got some of those bodies may be not, not the best way they were stolen from grace sure um, yep. we, we definitely touched on cases, that too you touched on yeah. that too yeah, we did yeah. I, I think that they, it, there's that, that important aspect about how important learning about anatomy was for surgeons and how both of them, anatomy and surgery, were basically being studied here in St. Thomas's, basically hand in hand. And I think that that's one of the things that, you know, Asti Cooper really was very adamant that, you know, everybody had to have that experience before going into the operating theater. And, and I don't know, there's just something very wholesome about that. Um, he's well, also, the, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask, like, that, that whole track of, like, getting up to that level of experience, do you, do you have an idea, like, how long that took? Because, like, nowadays... You know, if people don't know, it's, you know, if you want to go to school and you want to be a surgeon, let's say, you know, you're going to do your at least four year or whatever college degree. Then you're going to do four years of medical school and then you're going to do um, surgical residency, which I believe is generally five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can like specialize beyond that in certain respects. But, you know, so you're talking what, nine, no, let's see, eight, eight plus. Yeah. So you're you're, you're pretty much. um 12, 13 years before you're really on your own uh, doing surgery. You know what I mean? Is, is it a similar time frame, do you think, back then? Or do you think it was shortened a bit more? It was shortened. I mean, before the establishment of the medical, like, of this, the surgical school in the 18th century, this is when you actually have a surgical school established. Surgery was part of the guild system. So you basically train on a one-to-one -one basis for seven years. And you got to learn all of the skills from the main surgeon. And that's it, you know? And after seven years, there you go. You are now the new surgeon. And you can now take sure. on all of these things and, and that's ready to go. With the establishment of the of the surgical school in the 18th century, the idea was basically to to really codify that knowledge and try to get more surgeons because they were needed. And so it was you codify your knowledge into a curriculum. Everybody learns the same things more or less at the same time. Uh, and of course, what you will do is you still will have apprenticeships uh, in surgery, but then you will have things. I think that the time frame was about four years, mm. you know, uh, mm, until fair. you could potentially kind of like become a surgeon. Yeah, that's 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 pretty much pretty it. efficient. 
it is it, it is efficient in many ways, you know, because at that time, you know, there weren't that many operations or that much knowledge sure. that they had to <laughs> to be connected with. You know, that's true. I mean, that's true too. They were not being taught uh, like university. They did not have to go through, you know, a university system. This was outside of the university uh, when the surgical schools were established. That was a transition period between the guild system that came from sure. before um, and then the university system that was that absorbed the, the, the surgical school later, you know. So it, it just took a, a little bit of like a, a different route. So, yeah, it was about like four years, more or less. Um, and then, you know, your residency is when you become a dresser. Um, call a dresser because you basically dress wounds after the yeah. operation. Um, there were no theater nurses, so your dressers were the only ones that could potentially be in the operating theater with you. You had four hmm. dressers per surgeon, so that was your limit. You have four dressers, one surgeon, five people in the operating theater, and most of the the the, <laughs> the things that the dresser had to do was basically hold the patient down uh, so they didn't yeah. move. You know, nice. or hold a, a leg down or something like that. Yeah. Um, sure. Uh, ensure that you have like uh, some sort of like, I don't know, a, a leather strap, a piece of wood to bite on for the pain, because obviously we're talking about pre anesthesia. Sure, sure. And and yeah, just just amputate as fast as possible. I mean, yeah. under two minutes, yeah. it's the most well, ideal kind of like situation. But yeah. It, if there weren't any nurses in the operating room, who yelled at the medical students? That's what I want to know. <laughs> oh, trust me, the, 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 the surgeon the, the surgeon took care of it? Yeah, okay. Or it could be the, the people in the stands, too. Oh, yeah. would they that be would have been participating? Rough. Like everyone's I mean, like, oh, no. I mean, I, I need you to picture this because I want to know if you had a similar experience. So I'm going to paint a picture, okay, of how the operating mm -hmm. theater actually felt on Fridays at noon because operations were always delayed to Fridays at noon. Okay, so okay. in St. Thomas's, that's when you had an operation at noon on Fridays in the operating theater for the women's wards. And you will have, first of all, as you enter into the operating theater, and you remember that I mentioned that you have stands, and you go from the mm -hmm. lower ones, which are the closest to the operating theater, to the highest ones, which are at the back. So according to your status, uh, you will sit in different rows. So if you are another surgeon with their dressers, they will sit in the first in the front row. Next row okay. will be like uh, fourth year students, third year students, first year students will be all at the back. So basically sure. with time, you get closer to the actual operating theater. If you are a VIP, they will place chairs in the actual floor of the operating theater. So oh, you can sit down seats. and floor watch, seats. you know, floor <laughs> seats if you're a VIP. Now, when you actually did this, you also have porters um, that will come in and not only were there to help the patient come through the doors. Again, they will also be the porters who will take the patients up the stairs of the hospital that were normal, <laughs> like a lot shallower. <laughs> not, not, the, uh, circular, uh, not the circular, not the circular staircase. So you will get all the way up, you know, and once you're all the way up, what is going to happen is that the patient will be prepped by, especially if, if, in the women's wards, um, they will never be disrupted in the operating theater. They will always wear like kind of like a kind of night nightgown. And of course, they will be blindfolded before they got into the operating theater. This had to do because even though, you know, they thought that they were doing a um, kindness to yeah. the patients. <laughs> it totally doesn't make it more terrifying at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. But uh, you were actually agreeing to to kind of like uh, give up your privacy in order for you to be treated by the best. Because sure. St. Thomas's Hospital was not a hospital for the rich. This is also very important. The origin of hospitals in this country and in many other places in Europe, for example, were for the working poor or the deserving mm. poor. There were spaces of charity. There were not spaces where the rich will come and they will get preferential treatment. On the contrary, you know, if you were rich, you would be treated at home, but not mm. basically in an operating theater. And and this pretty much gave the gave surgeons this idea that because the patient is from the lower classes, um, because the patient in that time period from that lower class is not that important. And I say this between quotation marks. We know that how large is important. But, you know, at that time period, that's how everything was perceived. Because the patient in an operating theater at that time period were going to die regardless, they could push the boundaries. Oh, mm -hmm. that's kind of dark, but yeah, mm -hmm. sounds... I mean, yep. you no, call no, it no. dark. You call it dark, but I will, I will give you the reason why I actually feel... I, I, I like to turn this around, especially in our operating theater, because once you actually know that... I mean, we have the case of Elizabeth Reagan, 60-year-old woman who had a compact fracture, had gangrene, and she was operating in, in um, our theater in 1823. Mm -hmm. And 
her surgeon was Benjamin Travers, who was basically really well known for his ophthalmic surgery. But unfortunately, he wasn't so well, let's just say that he wasn't as skilled with big members. Mm. Like, mm. let's <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Okay. It's kind of like Max. Yeah. I know. Yeah. He was so really he's usually good. an eye surgery guy, not yeah. really a leg amputating guy. Like Friday yes. at noon, very everyone else was gone. Very different skill set. Yeah. Like, very oh, different no. skill set. Very different skill set. But he was one of the demonstrators in the operating theater of St. Thomas's. So once Elizabeth Reagan was brought in blindfolded and into the space, um, she had been asked if she consented to the operation. By the way, there was consent. The surgeon will hmm. go and tell you. Your, ga- your leg has gangrene. We need to amputate to save your life. Do you consent? And she will say yes. Mm-hmm. And then once she said yes, there is no backseat. You can turn your... <laughs> you you can decide oh. not to have it. Okay? <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. We got so, the consent, but not the full patient autonomy. I get that. Exactly. Yeah. So no there backs. you have it. You know, once you actually say that there is no backseat, no take backs, you have to go through. And the porter's job was basically to stop the patients from running away. <laughs> After they yep. brought them into the operating theater, <laughs> I, if I remember correctly, I think uh, Lindsay Fitzharris's book, *The Butchering Art*, begins yeah. with that exact, like that exact. It's a list in doing the surgery, <laughs> and it's it's finding like the patient running away, and then they have to go grab the yep. patient and bring them back. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, that's terrifying. At least uh, you know, hey, at least when they did that, I'm sure they reaffixed the blindfold, and now you were being <laughs> held against your will. <laughs> nice. And it probably, it, you know, by the time you were done screaming and trying to deal with this situation emotionally, you're probably so drained that it, maybe it did calm you down. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. So take, take into consideration that they usually did that on women. Not many men actually uh, had the blindfold, mostly women. But I, I think that the, the interesting part is that once you actually had that, pa- that, that picture painted and once she was placed in the operating table in, in, in the operating theater, after all of the patients were already, all of the students were already there, uh, the students will not be quiet. I mean, you have to imagine that our space, it feels small. But about 125 men will be packing their oh, like, wow. sardines, Jeez. you know, pushing each other, trying to make sure that they had enough, kind of like a good side to see what they were all what breathing was all over the patient. Yep. Yep. Also, they will be smoking. Yep. So As one and there is yeah. no ventilation in our space and there would have been people smoking in the actual space. So you can imagine this kind of like cloud of smoke at noon, <laughs> you know, kind of like descending on the operating theater. <laughs> Some of them might be coming in eating oysters, you know, very cheap food at the time. <laughs> Wait, really? So really? yeah, I'm not kidding. I mean, they will try and bring some food with them sometimes while they were watching. This. Smuggle oysters in, <laughs> so in the that, pocket. That Seinfeld <laughs> skit with, um, Kramer dropping the milk dud in the in the patient. That's not that far off. No, no not not them. <laughs> I mean, and this is just a student, you know, like like the and of course, imagine the energy, the excitement of the students. You know, the demonstration about to take place. Everybody trying to see what's happening, trying to understand. Some of them may to be taking notes, you know, as, as much as possible. Um, and then, of course, you have the dressers that have already prepped the space. They sprinkle sawdust all around the operating table. They put a blood box underneath the member to ensure that uh, very little like blood is going to be lost and is going to be absorbed absorbed by the 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 sadas as well mm, i was gonna ask about that okay yeah so that's easier pretty much to clean up blood. it's easier to clean up i mean there is some sort of rudiment, rudimentary health and safety i mean the last thing that you want to go is being in an operating theater with puddles of blood even in a wooden <laughs> floor and going around with a knife saying whoopsie mm-hmm. because you know <laughs> yeah. you on the blood. actually generally if you're in an operating room and you say whoopsie it will get a reaction I, i'll be honest <laughs> with you it will get a reaction I, not I a word they like to hear it's not, no, it's never a good word. You know, that's why you have like basic health and safety. You put sadas in the floor to make sure that it absorbs any blood and you're not going to slip while you're operating, right? Um, so when, these, uh, when Lisa Reagan was brought into the space, I think that Benjamin Travers had, had this horrified kind of like, look, um, one of the members in the public was from The Lancet, which was also it's a medical journal. Um, it's mm-hmm. still going strong today. Um, sure is. And sure it is. was actually founded by John Wakefield, who was a St. Thomas's man. He basically was the first one to write it. And the first actual uh, lecture that was published in The Lancet was by Sir Ashley Cooper. It was uh, his notes that he took on his lecture. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but The Lancet basically had one of the, 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 the surgeons that attended that day was there and 
he basically tried to write up like how the procedure actually went, right? Mm. And and he was the one that, and this is one of the reasons we have this, this case study where he was saying how horrifying it was because throughout the procedure, Benjamin B. Travers made the decision to amputate the leg, not below the knee because it was still salvageable, but above mm. the knee, mm. which, you know, it I think it's like that the femur is a lot Harder, yep. to, harder to, to cut, cut through, cut yeah. <laughs> Seems kind of bigger, bigger you know, bone, bigger, yeah. you know, bigger arteries. Yeah, you get yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it was um, apparently that was very harrowing. I mean, she was already sixty. She had already had like the infection with gangrene a couple of days uh, set before going into the operating theater, and and yeah, he had his um, his assistants like holding the leg, making the cut. He basically did um, attempt to do flaps at this time. This is one of the procedures that was introduced um, as well mm. in St. Thomas's. It went from going from a complete like uh, circular cut, you know, where of course after the amputation you have all of your raw member like meat still like there. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know how to explain that. No, I, I mean, no, no that's a good explanation. We all have a vivid yep, picture, yep. And like <laughs> a well painted, like yep. a bone in ham. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Oh, exactly. Yep. Oh, yep. I am, oh my god! It is. Um, and then, of course, like the idea of flaps is that you either cut like doing an oval section, so you you cut an excess amount of meat, and then of course you put that over the the um, the, the limb after it has been amputated, so that your mm -hmm. own meat and skin kind of like tights in with your your own body, and that kind of covers it and protects it better. Um, yeah, you, you, you basically right. coat it in a blanket of the, yeah, the no, that, yeah. So yep. yeah, when you're making a flap, you're 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 cutting a section of skin, and you're trying to do it in a way where you can take that section and move it to another area that's nearby while keeping that flap attached somewhere to the skin it was coming from. That way, it has blood supply and it can stay. So you're it, it's uh, if you if you cut the top layer of skin, it will stretch a little bit. Like you can't go super extreme. You can't take a flap from like the the, the thigh and you know. Well, you could put it on the forehead, but you'd have to bring up the leg to the forehead. But you know, you can kind of get it nearby. And so it, after you've made the uh, amputation and you've got this stump, especially if it's in the thigh, so it's a big yeah. big stump, you do want to cover it with something because. You know, otherwise, the as Mike put it, the uh, bone and ham meat that's hanging out there is just there to be infected, basically, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you can cover it and start making a seal of skin over it, then it's going to at least protect it. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is one of those those techniques that were basically tested in an operating theaters, you know, where people were trying to figure out, well, this is going, this, this actually works better, you know, than before. And St. Thomas's did the jump. And of course, you know, Benjamin Travers was very, very, very highly criticized for, for not saving the knee when he could have. Mm. I was going to say, I, I want to know how that story ends. So basically. <laughs> yeah. So basically he was, apparently he was very clumsy when he was trying to, to amputate the leg. Um, he not had, a good adjective he, for a surgeon. No, not a good adjective for him. And, and I, I hate that because he was really good with ophthalmic surgery. I mean, he basically <laughs> founded more fields of ophthalmic sure. like surgery, like hospital here in London, making, you know, ophthalmic surgery actual an actual profession you know within an, a you know the medical profession like a discipline right yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. yet he just could not do this he kept this woman in the operating theater for 20 minutes oh no when oh, you were supposed that's, that's to have like less than two minutes uh, kind of like amputations you know you want something quick and fast because you know if, if you're not going to kill your patient with the shock then you're going to kill them with blood loss um and mm. in, that's just in the operating theater right yeah, I think that halfway through her 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 procedure, you know, with these twenty agonizing minutes, she was giving some brandy and wine to revive her a little bit because she oh, started feeling very good. Yeah, that's good. good. Yeah, all Why the brandy, not? all of it, all, all the of brandy, it. all the brandy, just a little bit. Um, and then, of course, he managed to finish the the entire procedure, and of course, the flap was put over. Everything was like uh, the dressers dressed the wound, and she survived the the, the whole okay. procedure. I mean. She survived the actual procedure in the operating theater. <laughs> okay. He was given about half a liter of brandy and got her into a <laughs> drunken stupor to deal with the pain in the ward. Uh, but I think that uh, between the time that she was in the operating theater and the fact that the infection had already kind of like gotten hold of her, she did die about three days later uh, from infection mm, yeah. in the ward, yeah. you know? 
which you know, kind of like a sad story, but that's kind of like one mm -hmm. of the really kind of like, uh, and then of course you have these these other um, surgeon that was criticizing uh, Benjamin Travers in the Lancet it was like brutal. It's like we yeah. we have nothing well, good to say about him. Therefore, we will say come... nothing. <laughs> well, I, we've come across some of that. He's in very some grown of up. The, <laughs> the, the, yeah, I mean, in some of the stories that we've talked about with surgeons and uh, other physicians of the time, mm -hmm. seeing how they would talk to each other in public journals and the, uh, the, the lack of nicety in some of the times yeah. and just open criticize. And if it wasn't in the medical journals, it was in a newspaper. You I, know? Mean, I, I do feel a little bad because y you don't send an orthopedist to do an ophthalmologist job or vice versa. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they're very different. It takes a special kind of bravery to operate around the eye as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah. I don't I like mean, scraping foreign bodies off so. the surface of the eye. So I, yeah, I do no, have respect no. for that. The I only thing I it. can think like, I, I can't imagine this because sometimes when we have, you know, you have a specific age of, of child. So you have like a, about an 18 month old to a four year old that has a very tiny cut on say the forehead or something like that. And Wait, you, you just always... appeared with a pair of hemostats in your hand. Yeah. I, no, I, I think this. they were, oh, I thought they were oh. eyelash curlers. No, no, no. <laughs> this, it's just like my fidget spinner. But anyway, okay. <laughs> so like, you know, like maybe a half centimeter cut in a, in a toddler, you'll say to the parents, look like we could, you know, we could sedate this child, but there's risks and we have to start an IV and you're going to be here three hours, or we could just hold this child down and, numb the skin appropriately and so on. There won't be pain, but toddlers, of course, are scared of you. So it's, it's really hard to put like two stitches in a toddler's face. And you also develop mm -hmm. superhuman strength yeah, during those times. You can have as many dressers as you want. But strongest like, human in the world is a toddler Houdini. that doesn't want you. Yeah. Like you're I doing mean, a laceration. Yeah, the arms are there and then there's an arm grabbing your stitch. Right, you're like, wait, right. how, how did you get that arm, get arm out? out of there? So we, and we have a little papoose, like, you know, there's a board with like straps, Velcro straps. Yeah, burrito so you like wrapping papoose, thing, You yes. burrito wrap the child. You know, and the, the parents are usually in there, but then all the nurses go in and like at least two providers and the parents usually help. And like everybody comes out of that room exhausted after <laughs> and two stitches, that's yeah. that's for like two tiny little stitches. I cannot imagine what this must have been like. I an mean, an adult, an adult, yeah. an adult down <laughs> I mean, yeah. with an acutely oh, painful man. procedure. Like, I'm sure they were yeah. trying to get I was just wondering, like, how many of these went like halfway through the bone before the person was like out of there you know <laughs> i don't you consent i don't consent i don't well, no like yeah just like <laughs> just i'm done right this. away yeah stop, stop. like i said yeah. there's oh, there, 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 there are no boxes you know after you yeah. have consented you have to follow through and that's just pretty much it there's nothing else that you can do at that time i think that i mean this is like one of our main like stories and examples for the operating um theater that we have like the full story and it happened in our operating theater which would give us names and you know, actions and voices, you know. Yeah. But it's it's a story that actually doesn't have a great ending because obviously our patient kind of like died from the infection that happened afterwards. And of course, this is the pre-anesthetic era. But I kind of like, I always like to turn it around because if you actually see the numbers of survival rates in the operating theater, it used to be about 70%. And but this was you know, like... It's not it's, bad. For, for the era, right? I mean, that's, you know, you're looking at cases that were super difficult and there's no yeah. antibiotics, no anesthetics yeah. or no anesthesia. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's pretty yes. impressive, actually. I think so, too. But at this point of view, the, the surgeons were only actually doing surgery on cases that they knew that they could actually save someone's life. I mean, it wasn't well, done really, mm -hmm. really, you know. They knew that these procedures will save someone's lives if done, and then it was up to luck, and the body's remarkable ability to recuperate itself, you know, mm -hmm. to deal with, you know, the infection, which at that time they didn't know what it was. And then if you actually survived the whole process, you, you lived. You went on to go about your business. If you basically had an amputation of the leg, the hospital will provide you with a pet leg, kind of a, bit of a pirate leg. Uh, and some crutches because St. Thomas has had carpenters working for them so that you will actually be able to leave, you know, the hospital at the same time. So every time they think about the operating theater, especially your space, you know, a lot of people just look at the horror and the blood and the, the dark side of it, the people that died, you know. And I always like to turn that around. It's like it's not about who dies, it's about how many people they did save, how many people they not only saved because, you know, they were trying to do their best at the time with the knowledge that they had and they pushed themselves in some cases to mm. to, to make these these changes in, in some cases but also the students that were there 
that were privy to that knowledge at first and then took that knowledge and then advanced it later, you know, in, in this very long chain of, you know, education and learning mm-hmm. of trial and error, you know, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. And when a procedure works, great. This is a new procedure that we have and it, is, it doesn't work great. We should never do it again. You know, there is mm-hmm, no mm-hmm. knowledge in this case. You have here this idea, this is how we're going to be doing this. And of course, you know, you see with the advent of anesthesia, and I'm sure that you you you, you heard about this in, from other, other, other historians, you know, the death rate increased exponentially when mm-hmm. anesthesia was introduced, you know? Yeah, because they could do, they would try things that they didn't know how to do yet or well, and they were mm-hmm. yeah they could take their time more difficult you didn't cases. have a screaming person because they didn't want to hurt them so like get it done get them out of here uh, yeah and it was well, yeah. anesthesia but no transfusion by at that mm. time so initially exactly. right and and they could like there were the areas of like the chest and the abdomen that there yeah. were surgeons oh, before places, that era yeah. that said there was no way we'll ever do surgery on those areas because nobody yeah. ever survives it but now that you had no, anesthesia you coming in to where you could yeah, I mean, like, oh my God, doing an open chest surgery on somebody who's you know awake and uh, whatnot would be nope. horrific. Nope, nope. Yeah. And so now they could try these things, as you mentioned. And yeah. so yeah, you're initially it was like yikes, but uh, at, uh, at least waiting in the wings was uh, uh, Joseph Lister and his carbolic spray. Almost there, because unfortunately, <laughs> like even almost. though Saint, almost there, because St. Thomas's, especially here in in London Bridge. It did no uh, anesthesia. So on the 9th of January, um, 1847, we have the first case of uh, uh, an amputation that takes place under anesthesia. And it's a child that is six years old. And Mm. they amputate one of his fingers. And Mm. he was put down through like uh, ether. So he kind of like passed out, you know, woke up and he's like, oh, you know, what happened? And like, oh, I did not feel a thing. And it was kind of like a really big thing. Again, one of these cases that ended up in the Lancet. And of course, in the operating theater, um, after it was rediscovered in 1956, they basically kind of did an analysis of the floorboards and underneath the floorboards, there was this um, huge amount of sawdust. Um, And they discovered that there were remnants of ether and chloroform around the head of the operating table. So Hmm. we have also kind of the archaeological record that women were also being, um, you know, operated upon with under anesthesia at that time, you know, after 1847. But -hmm. until 1862, when St. Thomas's move site, so it used to be in London Bridge, now it's in Lambeth. It's still the same hospital, but obviously it had to move because the railway wanted to connect Charing Cross with London Bridge um, and the lands of the hospital were in the way and it was a mandatory kind of like sale that they had to do by the government. Mm. You know, progress. The railway is more important than the hospital. Mm. Hospital can be (laughs) moved somewhere else. Um, And that's pretty much how the space kind of ceased to be a hospital here in St. Thomas's and then just went to the other side and every every single building around here was repurposed in, in many ways and the attic itself forgotten for about a hundred years. But yeah, it's like huh. it's 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 this idea that, you know, despite everything, um, you know, we did not actually see antiseptics. And I think that mm-hmm. if we had actually survived up to 1865... Oh, you mean at the hospital there? You're yeah. saying? That the, so Here. when they were practicing in the hospital? Oh, wow. So yeah. just yeah. just before. Okay, yeah. So so uh, St. Thomas's here in London Bridge never saw the advent of antiseptics because it moved in 1862, which meant that this operating oh. theater yeah, predates, sure. you know, anesthesia, but then there was anesthesia with everything made out of wood, and then it just completely missed on antiseptics. And I think that that was a good thing. Because I believe that with the advent of, of antiseptics and understanding of germ theory, it pretty much meant that a lot of the operating theaters in many of the hospitals, they had to be repurposed and rebuilt to follow up with kind of like the new protocols. So instead of having operating theaters made out of wood, which was the traditional way of doing it, in the attic of churches or, you know, buildings, because skylight, oh, by the way, I forgot that we have a humongous skylight, sure, you know, sure. that illuminated all the operations, hence why noon was a good time to operate. So now you have the ability to actually do that in uh, spaces that were more appropriate, that were easier to clean and disinfect. What did they switch to, if not wood, uh, for a lot of the construction? What did they use instead? They use ceramic tiles. Okay, that makes sense. So for the longest time, there's a couple of operating theaters that date from the early 20th century that are still in existence. And what they actually have in their interior are just tiles. 
you know. Yeah, okay. yeah. makes this so, place even more of a time capsule, though, because you know yeah. everything else would have been torn down or repurposed, or yeah. that space would have been changed. The, this one yeah, would have been destroyed yeah, as well. Saying. Yeah, you know, That's if, really if cool. it hadn't been for yeah. that, because you know, space is a premium in hospitals, isn't it? I mean, it's not like right. they have a bunch of space to change things. It's just that every time that you have to find something else, you have to repurpose what you already have, um, and this is one of the things that um, that was very important to 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 be able to do and so the new St. Thomas's in in Lambeth was basically built with just ceramic tiles all around you know with its own operating theater separate room huge skylights lots of gas lots of electric like like gas and electricity you know lights in inside the space and it was very different after that you know that's when I think that surgery really kind of like moved leaps you know um, after yeah. the oh, it became legitimized. The, the golden yeah. age of surgery, right? When they started doing all sorts of crazy things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and it became legitimized, especially with the Lister coming along and introducing yeah. antisepsis. Surgeons went from the uh, proverbial kind of bottom of the medicine totem pole. They were not well thought of for a long time. Uh, they did the things that nobody else would want to do. And so all the yeah. picture that can be painted of the grim operating room and, you know, it, it's not that they enjoyed it. In fact, there's a lot of writing that they say it was, it was anguishing for There's just nobody else who would do these things. And yeah. so the I remember reading accounts of when anesthesia gets introduced and how relieved surgeons are. They're just, yeah. oh my, I mean, to imagine, you know, when we do pr painful procedures, and we, we do what we can to mitigate. But, you know, you still have to anesthetize somebody, and that involves a little injection under the skin and the anesthetic burns and whatnot. None of us, I don't, none of us like hurting patients, you know, you know no. when, even when there's, even when we're going to no. mitigate it and it's going to yeah. be less down the road, it makes you sweat. It makes you feel, you don't feel great about it. And you can minimize it. You can, you can try to do things quickly. You can do things yeah. well, and it does help. But imagine doing the, the amputation with no anesthesia, and it, it's, it, it really did weigh on these surgeons. They didn't enjoy this. I know. This is one of the things that I, 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 I love, like, reminding people, you know, because as in any time period, you have really good surgeons and really crappy ones, you know? I'm sorry. But... <laughs> it's fair. <laughs> That's true. I mean, yeah. This is it's true. Just, it, it, it's a matter of skill, dedication, whatever. Uh, but from everything that I've read, you know, in, in many cases, you are absolutely right. I mean, the amount of, like, they had to really prepare themselves mentally to be able to do this because they were going to inflict a tremendous amount of pain on a fellow human being. And this w could not be easy, you know, for them, you know, at all. Yeah. And it, sometimes we talk about the agonizing pain of the actual patients, but then we always forget about the rest of the people that were there, you know, and the fact that someone had to do this, you know, had to mm -hmm. enact that kind of pain just to try to save their lives. And it wasn't even a done deal, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was all for like hope that it will, it will happen. Like at, at the top of the operating um, theater, there is um, the motto of the surgeons of St. Thomas's. It, it's a Latin inscription. It says, Miseratione non mercede. And it can be translated as for mercy, not for gain. You know, mm. that. They were there because they really wanted to help, you know, and this is what they were trying to do. They were trying to take all of the knowledge that they had, you know, and try to apply it on a trial and error basis. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't, you know, yeah. and from every single one of those attempts, something was learned. When I can imagine, take all of that, like for the listener, put it in your head and imagine standing in that operating theater. Right, and going to the old op museum, and standing in the center of that theater, and that's got to be that's got to be a cool thing. That and I know I can imagine Monica. Every day you go in, you got to yeah. think about that, don't you? I do. I mean, it's one of the things that I actually love when I'm here. It's um, it's being able to interpret these stories and being able to share them with other people, and and it's about learning about our shared humanity in many ways. You know, our fears about our own medical history or fears about, you know, our loved ones getting sick, having to go uh, on, under an operation and things like that. And then coming here, I mean, we had people in the past, we have a guy's hospital next to us as well. And we had this uh, gentleman who was going to have his leg amputated. And he came to us and he sat in the operating theater meditating for about five hours, hmm. just trying to kind of like think about what was going to happen to him and being able to just sit there and and just muster the courage, 
you know, to basically go through what he was going to have to go through and understanding what it must have been like in the past and how lucky he felt that he was going to do these kind of like operation now in the 20th century. That was like last decade, but, <laughs> but I yeah. think that still, there is, compared to, still, yeah, there is something, there is something really, really interesting in our space that, you know, invites that kind of meditation, invites uh, a lot of other like knowledge and, you know, a curious mind that wants to learn more about these things and about how things were in the past. And, you know, here it's not too difficult. This is an open exhibition. Uh, we don't have things behind a lot of glasses, maybe some of the more dangerous ones, you know, like we do have <laughs> medical <laughs> bottles with questionable contents, you know, <laughs> like mercury. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Fair. So, uh, you know, if, if it is. I think it's like an excellent kind of wrapping up point. But one thing I wanted to ask, you know, we obviously live on the other side of the pond, as it were. But mm -hmm. the, the museum there has some pretty cool virtual stuff that yeah. in, in events. Is that right? Is there anything coming up you would want us to point our listeners towards? Oh, my God. So we're actually trying to develop uh, our YouTube channel to ensure that we have not just plenty of in information that is really good about the history of the space, history of objects in our collection, understanding them in context. But we are basically going to inaugurate what we call the All Up Flex. <laughs> It's basically okay. uh, every single one of our past uh, virtual events will be accessible by a oh. donation on our back catalog. So we've had like a lot of talks about, you know, that we did interviews with uh, medical practitioners, including uh, Lindsay Harris, but uh, which you already mentioned. But we also had like great talks um, that had to do on menopause or on endometriosis. Um, we also had talks about, you know, syphilis in the Victorian era and, and just kind of like really incredible topics. Next year, we'll be dedicating um, our events program, including our virtual event program to the history of uh, herbal medicine, apothecaries and pharmacy. So we'll be looking at um, how that developed. We'll be looking at women in that practice. Obviously, witches will come into or, <laughs> or kind of like uh, work as well. Um, and people will have access um, to the virtual events program, uh, which they can access either, you know, live or they can just kind of like purchase back uh, episodes <laughs> to go like that. Um, must say Pretty that cool. we are a charity. So we do not receive any funding from any exterior kind of like um, funding body. So basically everything that we do is to raise funds to, so that we could continue to do the work that we do to care for the space, to interpret it, to work on our community outreach programs and um, education programs. Um, so every single penny kind of like helps us keep us afloat, especially after COVID. <laughs> well, and we'll definitely... Absolutely. we. Uh, certainly appreciate that we'll uh we'll be sure to make sure we have links and everything like that to the youtube page to the uh, museum's web page and uh, we'll make sure that hopefully everybody listening to the show can take an interest uh check out uh, the stuff and i will say you just take a stop at the regular web page even the videos you guys have up on there that, that the small like 50 second video that even just introduces if that doesn't get you get you into the right headspace for visiting yeah. I, I don't know what would well, I can give you just one more kind of like um, dips on exclusive news. Okay. <laughs> We're actually developing a very short sitcom called Mildred and Friends of what or you know, different objects in our museum actually do at night when we're not here. <laughs> they are supposed I to like be that. humorous and um, educational. They're under one minute and a half and, you know, we'll be releasing the first ones next year. We really appreciate you sitting with us and, and chatting with us. I think this was, uh, this yeah, was excellent. Was delightful. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Really cool. Really cool. Look uh, behind the scenes there at the old op museum. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. That's it's been great. <laughs> oh, actually, I want to add a little bit of a note after the interview that the Old Op Theater Museum will be under construction until April 1st. So don't go running by plane ticket until April 1st. We appreciate everyone listening, and we'd love to hear from all of you out there. If you'd like to send us a message or provide feedback, we can be reached through our website, www.poorhistorianspod.com. There you'll find all the links to our social media sites. We do take emails at poorhistorianspod at gmail.com, and we do work to respond to all 
all those posts on our various social media accounts. If you've got a moment, go ahead and tag us on social media. We love to respond to those messages and see them out there. If you'd like to support the show in other ways, check out our Poor Historians merchandise, including t-shirts, mugs, all that sort of thing, through our website links. So until next time, Poor Historians are signing out AMA. Oh, uh, there, there aren't any outtakes. This, this ran long enough. See you next time.